what you get is an interacting set of winds, winds colliding with other winds from the inside. That's a process that sculpts the nebula and helps to give it its interesting shapes. The most intriguing of the planetary nebulas are those with bipolar shapes. Mysterious forces within these strange objects cause glowing gas to shoot out in jets, reminiscent of the stellar jets from stars in the process of being born. How could two so similar phenomena happen at both the beginning and the end of stellar life? Jets are a ubiquitous phenomenon in astronomy. What all these jets have in common is the presence of an accretion disk, which is rotating gas, magnetic fields in the rotating gas. And as material flows through the accretion disk and loads on the field lines, it gets blown back out into space. But a dying star doesn't have a disk of material falling into it. That is, unless it's a part of a binary pair, two stars orbiting around each other. Binary pairs are very common in the universe. As the two stars rotate around each other, one of the stars is giving up mass to the other. Material flows from one star to the other, and you form an accretion disk. Magnetic fields appear in that accretion disk, and material is blown off it, just like in the other cases as well. Planetary nebulas represent the normal processes of star death throughout space. But there are giant stars in the universe that are far from normal. They conclude their lives in massive explosions. And often, the nebulas left behind are the only clues to just how they met their violent ends. In the year 1054, a massive star blew up 6,300 light years away from the solar system. From the Earth, it appeared as a new star, the most brilliant in the sky. Ten times brighter than Venus, it was visible in broad daylight for 29 days. It was noted by Chinese astronomers and perhaps the Anasazi of New Mexico, as seen in one of their petroglyphs. It faded away almost as quickly as it appeared, and today we can see it only through telescopes. But what's left of it is spectacular. A thousand years later, we call it the Crab Nebula, one of a variety of nebulas known as supernova remnants. Supernova remnants are essentially the expanding debris clouds from the stellar explosion of a really massive star. It's the death explosion of that massive star at the end of its life. Supernova remnants are something like planetary nebulas in that each results from the death of a star. As a star first evolves to become a planetary nebula, it ejects dense mass from its surface very slowly. This is not an explosion, it's just an ejection. A supernova is much simpler, it's just an explosion. Everything happens in seconds. And the nebula that we see around it is the shrapnel that still remains. The light show comes from the explosion's shock wave, smashing into the surrounding material and causing it to glow. The principle was dramatically illustrated as it actually happened in 2004, when the Hubble Space Telescope caught this shock wave, striking a ring of gas in the remnant of a supernova that exploded 160,000 light years away in 1987. Closer to home, the Crab Nebula remains the most famous of all supernova remnants. Studied through telescopes for 300 years, it contains a secret buried inside, undiscovered until 1968. At the very center is a pulsar, spinning at 30 times per second. A pulsar is a spinning neutron star, so dense that one teaspoon of it would weigh a billion tons. The one inside the Crab Nebula is just 18 miles across and weighs more than our sun. It's spinning fast, but losing energy by gradually slowing down. And the energy of its rotation is being transferred into the gas, and in fact, much of the radiation in that nebula is powered by the slowdown of the pulsar. That radiation is seen as the eerie blue glow in the center of the Crab Nebula. 
It is generated by electrons moving at near the speed of light through the magnetic fields of the pulsar. But there's more than a blue glow. Recent space photos reveal that the magnetic fields are stirring up the center of the nebula. You see little ripples emanating out from the pulsar. It's not a bad analogy to think of magnetic fields as stretched rubber bands. And when you pluck them, you cause a disturbance that works its way through them. And that's what's going on somehow or another. The details are beyond us. But we can see the phenomenon, and it's quite clear. The death of the star that formed the Crab Nebula is part of the life cycle of the galaxy. The gas expelled into space as supernova remnants and planetary nebulas returns to the interstellar medium, where it becomes raw material for future generations of stars. This process cannot go on forever, because we have a finite amount of hydrogen gas. Sooner or later, you use up most of the hydrogen and helium, which light up the stars, and the stars blink out. When you look at the Milky Way today, 97% of its mass is in stars. 3% is left in gas. And as star formation proceeds, that reservoir is going to go down and down and down. Certainly, star formation will slow down because this gas is just harder to get out of the ground, as it were. But astronomers using the Green Bank Radio Telescope have recently discovered one source of gas in a massive cloud outside the Milky Way. The very interesting thing about this cloud, which has been called Smith's Cloud, is that it's very massive. It's got about a million times the mass of the sun in it of gas and dust. Well, this cloud is headed right toward the Milky Way, and in 20 to 40 million years, it's going to collide with us. Now, that's going to create a pressure, a shock wave. And it may set off a generation of hundreds of new stars when it collides with the Milky Way. As the gas in Smith's cloud is compressed by the collision, a brand new star-forming nebula will light up the galaxy, and the life cycle of the universe will continue. In the long term, however, there aren't enough Smith's clouds to keep the process going, and nebulas will gradually disappear. The universe is about 14 billion years old, and come back in 100 billion years and look at the Milky Way, the big, bright, massive stars can't form anymore. All that's left are the ancient remnants of stars that formed in the long past. It's a dull place a very dull place. We live in an exciting time in the era of the universe before stars burn out and the reservoir of new material is gone for forming new stars and planets. It's a privileged time. A time when the sky still remains filled with the lights of the great Orion Nebula, the pillars of creation, and the eye of God each one a small marvel of nature in the vast expanse of the universe.